Sir, can you hear me, sir? Uh, yes. Yes. Will you be Hello. starting the session after 10, sir? After 10.30. Yeah. Okay, sir.
start the session now. Hello guys, good morning and welcome all in this emerging technology webinar. Myself, Archie this said, I'm a host for this session. Guys, if you want any question and queries, please put question on chat first. We will try to help you out. So moving ahead, today event sponsor for this webinar is Synergetics. So Synergetics is a learning India most distinguished learning company in IT technology. We are ready with our top class learning solution that can be made to fit every requirement in every sector across every industry around the globe. Our spends our expensive greenfield solution include that is a persona based onboarding solution, onboarding add on solution, certification solution, certification add on solution, reskilling solution, emerging technology training solution, certification hackathon solution, crowd adoption solution, that is technology training solution, sales pre sales training solution, practice playbook solution, and architecting solution. So today webinar is organized by the ETC community and sponsored by the Synergetics and Microsoft. Our ETC community is open to all the people who are interested in our emerging technology and our various emerging technology company. You guys, you just to have guys, you just have to install the Meetup app and you can follow our community there. Then you have to follow code of conduct. Please note that no one is allowed to take screenshot of the presentation and cannot do screen recording. If you have any technical question related to the topic, you can use the chat box to ask your question. We will uh, upload this training on our official YouTube channel. Today's speaker for this training is Mahindra Shinde. He is a training consultant and currently works with Synergetics as a practice DevOps head. Agenda for this webinar, you will get you will get an overview on the topic and more. Make sure guys you follow us on our social media platform for upcoming uh, updates and upcoming uh, events. Thank you. Now I would like to hand over, some, hand over this mic our speaker. He will continue ahead. Yeah, thank you, Archie. Yeah, hi, good morning, everyone. I hope I'm audible to all of you right now. So here we are. I hope um, my, my screen is also visible to all of you right now. Okay. So uh, as Archie has mentioned already, this part, today's session, we are going to discuss DevOps and the new trends in DevOps. We are going to focus on a component or a, a new, relatively new component of DevOps called KitOps. What exactly KitOps is all about and how it can be beneficial for quick application release or let's say deploying applications, continuously deploying the applications to the customers even faster than your traditional DevOps workflows. So we will start with the traditional DevOps first and then we will go to first we will talk about DevOps, then we will talk about GitHub, GitHub as a DevOps platform, and then we will talk about GitOps. GitOps as a concept, I will explain to you what GitHub, GitHub uh, sorry, GitOps as a concept is. And then uh, we will take one example of GitOps, Argo CD, as an example for the demo. Okay. So in this training, what uh, I'll do is I'll create some diagrams to make the concept more easier to understand. Yes, second, I guess my screen is already visible to all of you. Here we are. So this is where I'm going to draw some diagrams for most of the concepts. And here we start. So there are three modules I have created under this uh, particular heading, DevOps, GitHub, and GitOps. So first about DevOps, how many of you have already worked with DevOps or know a little bit of DevOps? May I know? You can all raise your hands in Microsoft Teams. You can use the button to raise your hand so I will know that how many of you know about DevOps. Okay, so we got our first one. Nagarjun. Okay, that's good. Nagarjun, sorry. Nagarjun or Nagarjun? Nagarjun. Okay, fine. Anybody else?
Yeah, fine, no worries. Let's continue with DevOps introduction then. As you know, before DevOps, we had traditional responsibility silos. Now, what exactly this concept is? Traditional responsibility silos, the, the concept is like this. There are multiple roles. There are multiple people involved in building an application and releasing that application to the customer. So we have developers. Developers have their own roles, their own responsibility, and they do not care, basically, how architect, QA, and DBA will work. Whenever you face any kind of challenge to, whenever there is a challenge, uh, any kind of uh, issue with delivering application to the customer, each one of them will try to find that how it is not their responsibility or how it is not their fault. So developers will often say that it works on my system and I don't know why it didn't work on the client system. Architect is one who will not actually get involved in the development activities. Architecture will be more focused on overall design architecture of application requirements and so on. Testers always have a totally different view for themselves and database administrators, they'll say our responsibility is limited to the database, database schema and management and maintenance. So very often product or your software which you are building suffers due to these individual responsibilities of these individual people. And in traditional software development, there is no much collaboration between them. There is no much collaboration between them. And this less collaboration or working in isolation creates lots of challenges in software or in product. Now, this is not just limited to software as a product. This actually takes into or this can be applicable to any product's life cycle. A designer of a product might have a different view about it. The end user will have a different view about it. Engineer might have a different view about it. Tester might have a different view about it. And that, that is a biggest challenge in software development or any kind of product development. There are separated disciplines. Each one here has their own pre-created rules and responsibilities and uh, tasks they need to do and they will concentrate on their task. Fragile integration, the integration of all these roles is often very fragile. Now this is where DevOps was introduced. And let me tell you one thing, DevOps is better basically more about collaboration than using any kind of tool or any kind of workflow. So what exactly is a DevOps? DevOps is union of people, process, products to enable continuous delivery of a value to your user, to your end users. So DevOps is more about collaboration, IT operations team, development team, quality assurance, that is QA team. All of that, and of course, even though architect is not mentioned here, architect is included as well. So in DevOps, generally we just use term DevOps, which means developer and operation, but don't this, this definition is little misleading. DevOps actually recommend integration and collaboration between everyone. All the teams are put together, collaborate together to build a quality product. That is what DevOps is. It's a union of people. First thing, union of people, collaboration between individuals, then processes, and the final one is product. Now, product means what tools do you use? Like whether your developers use Eclipse IDE, whether your developers use Git or SVN repositories, whether or not your developers use Docker containers or build applications in container format, all those are products tools. First priority is always union of people, integration between collaboration between people, then processes, the workflows, and then finally the tools. I hope that's clear to everyone. Now the next thing, after implementing DevOps, now this was a report generated by uh, an organization called State of DevOps. The report is titled Strategies for New Economy from N for Sen and Humble and Keen. 
DevOps research, research and assessment. Uh, this report was generated in year 2018. And as per this report, most of the organizations who adopted DevOps, they benefited like this. There was 46 times more deployment. So their deployment frequency increased. They can deploy more number of times. Okay, 46 times deployment frequency is a, such a high number. So whenever your application, your product goes through any kind of change request, they were able to release the change faster than earlier. 7x lower change failure rate. Now what is low change failure rate? Anyone? It's a very simple generic English word. Change failure rate. Just drop the lower for a minute. Change failure rate. Anyone? Kesavan, Amit, Ramdurai, anyone? Hello? Bhavesh, Vaibho, Vengi, Arvinda, anyone? Change failure rate. Yes, somebody has replied. Number of defect when deploying. Arvindar and Yashwan. Okay, so change failure rate is you implemented some changes or you released some change to the product, but they didn't work as planned. And you have to roll back your application to the previous version because the recently made changes did not work properly. They failed. So DevOps basically allow them not to just increase the frequency of deployment, but to also lower the failure rate. 2,555 times faster lead time to changes. So changes, implementing changes were much faster now. And 2,604 times faster mean time to recover. Now what is mean time to recover? Mean time to recover means on an average, how much time your team took to fix any issues in the in the product so that was also much faster now and because of these four unique benefits the result the final result was faster time to market and increased revenue so those organizations who were adopting devops they gave these two business goals faster time to market, they were able to reach customers faster and therefore their revenue also increased. So this is this, is, this report was generated in year 2018. So it is much older now. But anyway, this is something, uh, a positive impact of DevOps on a business. So what exactly DevOps is? DevOps is more like this. We discussed the collaboration part more collaboration between the team members. But what about the DevOps workflow, the process? Typically, a DevOps workflow or a process somehow looks like this. On the left side, we have Dev, and on the right-hand side, we have Ops. Now, do you think it looks like a symbol of infinity? Anyone? This is because this is a continuous process. So where does it begin at? Any guess? What is the starting point here?
Yeah, sorry. Uh, requirement gathering plan, plan to monitor. Okay, yes. So planning is the first phase or planning is the starting point. So you start planning, coding, building, testing. Now these are the part or this part of the process is for developers or this is the dev process. After the test, you release, you deploy, you operate and you monitor. This is the ops part of the DevOps. Now, please remember one thing. Most of the DevOps project, see, there is one prerequisite for DevOps. Okay, and that prerequisite is you must first start implement agile project development or agile product development approach. You must be first on agile development model. If you use agile development model, agile recommends iterative a kind of iterative approach. I know there is an iterative approach as a independent software development approach as well, but Agile has some characteristics of iterative and incremental approach. That means we don't build everything in one single attempt. Rather, we split our development activities into multiple iterations. In iteration one, you plan, code, build, test, and release. In iteration two, again, you plan, code, build, test, and release. In iteration three, again, you repeat that. So in every iteration, like for example, once you release, deploy, operate, and monitor, your iteration one ends. And then second iterations, plan, code, build, test will start. Is that clear? So you should first implement an iterative approach. You should first implement an agile approach. Okay, agile is required. Okay. So what do we do with plan phase? In planning phase, we identify the requirements, what requirements we are going to implement. Okay, we have to identify like what requirements we will implement really in there. Okay. Then how we are actually planning to implement them. Is there any kind of prerequisite for it? Identify its prerequisite. And then do the proper study of the requirements, create a plan like how we are planning to implement them. What are the features? What are the tasks that you have to perform in this iterations? And what are the features or what implementation will be actually executed in the next iteration, not in this iteration? OK, what are the dependencies? Everything, the study, then the actual code, which is implementation phase. This is where developers write a code. Now, please remember plan. This is where developers, architects, designers, they all are involved. Coding, mostly developers. Building, mostly developers. Test, now this is where you need QA, right? You need to build, you need to test. And once it is tested, and once it is ready to go, once, once your QA department, QA team gives a go ahead for the product, then it is released. Okay? Now, whenever a product is released, it gets a release number or a release version. And then it's handed over to the ops team. And you know what ops team is supposed to do here? Take the release and actually deploy it on one of their servers. And guess what? We don't directly deploy to production. Am I right? A product never directly goes to production environment directly. It has to first go to multiple different environments, right? Multiple different environments. Like for example, we have dev environment, we have QA environment, we have pre-production environment. Yes, lower environments, you can say. There are several lower environments. Most of the organizations, they prefer four environments, dev, QA, staging, and then final production environment. And why there are so many environments required? Because you do some additional testing of those particular environments, product in the, those environments. And then finally, your application goes to the production environment. Now, please remember every environment requires some kind of operations team. Operations team has to maintain the environment. Environment maintenance is also an important activity, which means Installation or configuring the environment, the required setup, what runtime environment is needed for the application, what server runtime is needed, 
what kind of OS we should use, right? How many number of servers need to be there, whether everything is up to date, security, performance, everything properly planned and properly implemented. Now, Ops team will be taking over this entire process. It's not developers anymore. Developers have already handed over a final product to operations team to deploy, operate, and monitor. Now, it is the responsibility of the operations team to deploy and monitor the application. And if there is any bug, if there is any defect found, or if there is any, uh, you can say, uh, issue is found with the currently deployed application, they have to report it back to the development team. So that development team will work on it in the next iteration. Will they fix it and release it back to the operations team? So what do you mean by release? Release means developers simply give that particular pre-built package to the ops team saying that take this and deploy it and tell me if it works. Once you release, that means you stop all the build activities here when you release, right? It's a final product. You do not make changes after you release the product. Yes, you can make changes after you release it, only after you get a proper feedback from the operations team. And based on the feedback from operations team, you do the next planning. You will notice the next step after monitor is plan. So if there were any bugs, if there were any issues found, set the priority. There might be possibility that issues might have a higher priority than the next development activities or next feature you were planning to deploy or implement in the next iteration. So in that case, you first implement, you first implement the, uh, what we call it, uh, the bug fix, the issue fix, and then finally you build it, code it, test it, release it, and check for the feedback. If feedback is positive, then go ahead and implement the rest of the implementation. Is this part clear, everyone? Any question, any queries? Okay, great. We'll continue then. So this is what DevOps is. Now the workflows of DevOps. In DevOps, there are these three workflows. First one, of course, is continuous integration. Continuous integration, CI workflow. Second one is continuous deployment workflow. This will be actually implemented after the release is created. And then finally, continuous learning and monitoring. So this dark blue one is the continuous integration workflow. This one is continuous delivery, work, delivery workflow. And this one, monitoring, is continuous monitoring work. Sometimes you might actually include monitoring in continuous deployment workflow as well. But I believe keeping it separate makes more sense. Anyways, so you have continuous integration, you have continuous deployment, and you have continuous monitoring. So how does it look like? Continuous integration is when development team is building some product, writing some implementation or doing some kind of bug fix, right? And every time they make any change, continuous integration workflow will ensure the change is actually converted into a product that can be released, product that can be released. 
Now, in order to do that, development team, now obviously when I say team, there are more than one individual in it. It's a group of people. It's a group of people. And this group of people, how will they share the source code among themselves? How is it possible for multiple people to work on exact same code base? What should they do? They need to use some kind of source code management system, SCM, like Git. Harvinder, you are right. Git is a version control system or source code management, SCM system. There are others, like there is SVN, for example, or there is Mercurial, okay, and many others. Git is very popular one, and in this today's session, we are going to work on Git repositories only. Continuous, yeah, centralized system. SVN is centralized system and Git is distributed system, by the way. Okay, you may, you may use any system, either centralized or decentralized, but version control system should be there. Version control system, SCM, source code management system will actually, you know, help us in continuous integration. How? When any one of your member developer makes any small, minor, or major change to the Code continuous integration system will take the new changes to the code, rebuild the entire application automatically, and share the result of the rebuild process with all the development team and ask them for a review. Ask them for a review. If all the peer reviews were successful and if development team decided that yes, this new implementation from one of our developer should work fine and we should release it, then after their go ahead. It will go and build the application, create the jar file, var file, create the exe, dll, or zip, whatever format your application might use, whatever format your application binary might use, right? And then release it, hand it over to the operations team for the next workflow, which is continuous delivery and deployment, or continuous deployment, let's say. Yes. So once continuous integration system does everything, now of course there is another module that will be in, that you can implement here, which is continuous reporting. Continuous reporting is whenever any workflow does it work, like let it be continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, all these workflows should generate some kind of log or some kind of report. And this report must be accessible to all the teams, not just development team but everyone, all the stakeholders, operations, development, customers, everyone involved, okay? Once continuous integration workflow does the task, next one is continuous delivery and deployment. Now, this is where you take the application built by continuous integration workflow, workflow and release it, deliver it to environment like staging, QA, etc., and finally production. Then it becomes continuous, delivery and deployment workflow.
integration workflow in more detail. So what all different aspects of continuous integration workflow to be, to be used? First aspect, the source code management system. Source code management system will have some kind of trigger. What is a trigger? Trigger means a certain event. A certain event which will trigger some kind of activity in here. Okay, a certain trigger. Now that trigger usually is whenever a code change is detected. That is a trigger. Okay, a code change. Maybe one of the developer has made recently made a new commit or a new revision. Okay, or one of the developer raised the pull request so that the changes made by she or he should be accepted or approved, reviewed by the other peer developers. And once it is approved, once it is implemented, then it goes ahead and triggers or tell a signal or send a signal to CI tool that now you can go ahead and build this product or build this application. So what CI tools do we use? Have you, have you used any CI tool? Like for example, Jenkins, Hudson, Travis CI, Circle CI, or maybe GitHub, GitLab, anyone? Those are continuous integration tools, CI tools. SCM is source code management. Git is SCM. Okay, uh, there could be a query from you like what is a version control system and what is SCM? Please remember version control system is basically just a system to maintain multiple version of the same file and that file could be anything. But when, it, when we call it SCM, SCM is a subset of version control system. SCM is a source code management system, a system which is optimized for source code not the binaries and git is a very good example of it. even though as a version control system git can be used for any kind of files but it is optimized for application source code anyways So once SCM, okay, good. Krishna here has used Jenkins, which is a CI tool, a very popular CI tool rather. So continuous integration tools will then interact with or integrate with a certain build tool, a certain test automation tool to build and test the application. Now, please remember CI tool like Jenkins, those are generic tools. In order to build your application, or in order to test your application, Jenkins would depend on certain plugins or certain third party components to do that. Usually, build tool depends on the programming environment or the type of application you are building. In case, if you are building a Java application, do you know what kind of build tool is used for Java application building process? Anyone? Yeah, we can use Maven for Java web application creating jar file. Yes, not, not just for web application, for any Java projects, you can use Maven 
or you can use Gradle. Java applications will use Maven and Gradle. NPM is used for Node.js. Yeah, that's right. So you have to just use an appropriate build tool. Okay, you just have to use an appropriate build tool. And what if you are building a containerized application? In case of containerized application, the build tool you will use would be Docker. Docker as a build tool for creating container events. Then you have automated test cases. Now, this also depends on what technology you are using, right? Like node based technologies, there is Jasmine, okay? There is Chai. I'm not sure what other frameworks are there. So, there are frameworks for automating or running the test cases in Node.js, running test cases in Java, for example, Java guys, Java, you can integrate Maven. Uh, your test cases with Maven. You can just write MVN test and it will go ahead and run your JUnit or test ng test. Uh, Selenium, Jay Shankar, Selenium is uh, used for UI testing basically. Okay. But yes, this should be included. You should be able to automate integration test, unit test, system test, and the user interface test as well. So you automate that. And then once Test cases are automated. Once you execute the test case and you found that your product has minimum level of defects or acceptable kind of a defect, count of defect, or has no defect, you then build a deployable artifact from it. Now, deployable artifact, the definition depends on again technology. Node.js developers might probably create a zip file. Python developers will probably create a zip file. Just compress the contents. Java developers will be using jar file, var file, or EAR file. .NET developers might be building a .tll file, and so on. So deployable art, finally. In case of containerization, deployable artifact would be a container image in some container registry. Container image somewhere in some container registry. I hope this point is clear, everyone. Any question, any queries? I'll give you two minutes to think about this. Yeah, sure. I'll repeat it again. No worries. So basically what I'm saying is this is the complete CI workflow. What we do in CI workflow is take the application source code from the version control system. CI tool will be responsible for getting the source code, using the build tools to build it, compile it, using the automated test cases, some kind of test automation tool to run the test cases. And once you run the test cases, it will actually give you an idea whether or not your application or your implementation has any kind of bugs that need to be fixed. If everything is good, you go ahead and you package your application, create a deployable package out of your application and put it on server. That part will be covered later in continuous deployment workflow later on. Is this part here? So this is continuous integration. You take the source code, you build it, you run the test cases, and you prepare the final artifact. Now, please remember one thing, that that was C CI workflow. Another workflow is CD workflow, continuous delivery and deployment workflow. So what exactly do you do in continuous delivery and deployment workflow? In case of continuous delivery and deployment workflow, what, would, what we do here is, Wait a second. What do we do here in continuous delivery and deployment workflow is we use the same CI tool like Jenkins, for example. Yes, they can be used for both CI and CD activities. 
Okay, so Jenkins is basically a CI CD tool. But very often when referring to them, then we just call them CI tool. Anyways, let's not get uh, further confused there. But what your CI CD tool will do? Your CI CD tool will have multiple environment or stages pre created for it. So let's say you have a dev, QA, staging, and production environment pre provision. What you do next is take those environments, take those environments and deploy your application on them one by one. So let's say, for example, take your first application, right? And deploy it. Take the first application and deploy it directly on, uh, let's say, dev environment. After you, did, uh, after you finish the dev, dev environment, you can see. And run some tests on the dev environment. After that, take application to the Take application to the Next deployment. Deploy your application the next station. Staging environment. If everything is fine and if all the test cases are implemented properly, then you take your application to the next production environment. It's not breaking. I was taking pauses. I was taking a pause to give you a chance to answer or to write your answer. It's not breaking. Just give me a minute. I'll try my. Am I audible now? Hello? I've connected a new headset. Okay. Am I audible now? Fine. So to repeat, to repeat the process here, CD workflow is a workflow, continuous delivery deployment workflow is a workflow where you deploy your application in multiple environments one by one. Why multiple environments? Because you have to still run few more tests on your application okay like for example there would be a performance test there would be a stress test okay uh, then uh, there would be a user acceptance test and so on you also need to make sure that whatever environment you are deploying your application with that environment is properly con configured and it's actually giving you a proper level of security etc so that's why we have multiple environments 
And whenever application works better in any particular environment, then you move your application to the next environment. Okay. Final environment is always production environment, and that workflow is called continuous deployment workflow or CD, continuous delivery deployment workflow. Please remember, uh, continuous deployment workflow is very many a times people also use the term continuous delivery and deployment or continuous deployment and delivery. I will let you know what exactly is the difference between a delivery and a deployment in a few minutes. Okay. So this should be the workflow. Now these are the tools that you very commonly use. Like if it is Java application, your build tool would be Maven, Ant, and Gradle. Your test unit and integration test tool would be JUnit and TestNG. And you can build your application on either a Linux machine or a Windows machine. That's because Java is portable. Java as an environment is really very portable. And you can build your Java application on both Linux as well as Windows machine. Rather, you can build your Java application on Windows machine but later deploy it on Linux machine. It provides, it offers that level of flexibility. Okay. Yep. Fine. .NET. If you are a .NET developer or if you are building a .NET application, you must be using MS Build, Microsoft Build, or Visual Studio Build tool to build your application. Please remember, it is possible to build applications in .NET from command line. Okay, you should be using a command line tool to build and debug your application. It's much easier than it looks, basically. A command line tool. Okay, the next one is for unit test and integration test, .NET people will use N unit. .NET, most of the time, now please remember there are two different .NET environments. .NET Core, okay? .NET Core is one environment, and the other environment is? The standard classic version of .NET. The standard classic version of .NET is Windows dependent. You need a Windows machine to build it. Yes? .NET Core, on the other hand, you can build it on Linux as well. Then you have Python. The build tool would be PIP and test tool would be PyTest. For Node.js, the build would be NPM. The test automation can be performed using a tool called uh, Mocha. So have you used any of these tools for building and testing your applications, anyone? How many of .NET developers here have used these tools, for example? For .NET developers, very often you might have built it using Visual Studio, the IDE, instead of command line environment, most probably. Yep, Visual Studio, right? Okay, good. Not from DevOps background. Uh, Ramdurai, this is not even about DevOps. This is about development. So uh, what what is your current job role? Are you a developer? Okay. Okay, not me. I, I am not mean by that. Uh, so what role you are planning for? Are you planning for a developer role? Are you preparing for a developer role or system administration operations? What it is? If it is a developer role, then you must be using a tools like Visual Studio or Eclipse or something like that to build your application. 
Developers use GUI tools to build it, but in DevOps, you should use a command line interface. Right? Okay, no worries. Now, the common tools which are used for CI CD, the basic CI CD tools that you might use here are Circle CI, Jenkins, Azure DevOps. In Azure DevOps, basically, the deployment uh, build part is done by Azure Pipeline. Build and deployment is performed or is managed by uh, uh, this one, Azure Pipelines, basically. So these are different environments. Now, the common tool, other set of common tool, we can use something like FTP deploy, or web deploy. FTP deploy and web deploy are tools which are actually used in deployment scenarios. So what these tools basically do? These are the tools. I'm talking about these two tools, web deploy and FTP deploy. These two tools basically allow you to take your application, the build artifact, and put it on the server, either using FTP protocol or either using FTP or by using Web deployments, HTTP protocol. You can use both the protocols here quite easily. Last one is Git, which is version control system. FTP deploy, Krishna, FTP is a, uh, FTP is a very commonly used term, file, file transmission protocol, FTP is, uh, which is historically used for deploying application on remote servers. It's a very old kind of tool. Okay. It is a protocol just similar to traditional uh, HTTP protocol. But instead of web pages, protocol is instead used for sharing or copying files over internet. Okay, moving files over internet. That's the use of it. Okay. Fine. So what are the final benefits? Few points. Dev DevOps benefits are number one. DevOps basically allow us, for developers, dev, de, DevOps gives us automation. Automation means we can automate lot, lot, lots of work. Lot of our work could be automated here. Okay. Build and integration, for example. We get continuous integration. Every time you make any changes to your code, you, you would get a chance to automate that code or to integrate that code in rest of the software, in rest of the product, that is continuous integration workflow. You get continuous feedback. Continuous feedback means you get the immediate response from the build process, whether or not your application build as successful, was successful, or whether it failed, kind of, okay? For testers, what is benefit of DevOps to testers? Why testers should learn or should work in DevOps? For testers, these are the five benefits. Number one, for testers, you can have automation in testing. You no longer need to manually run any test cases. No manual execution at all. What you can basically do is, you can just run all your test cases automatically or invoke them, call them automatically based on a trigger. Also, testers will also get continuous feedback whether or not their test unit has passed, test units have failed, and if failed, what were the exceptions? To testers, DevOps actually allows integration of their favorite test, unit, uh, test engines, their favorite test engines or their favorite testing tool in the automated workflow, okay? Like for example, you can automate the Selenium test, you can automate the JUnit test, and so on. 
multiple different type of test could be automated here and multiple different testing tools could be used you could even integrate performance tests in automation workflows on devops workflows number 4 identical test environment what do you mean by identical test environment you can maintain a consistent test environment in devops rather for this you have to actually take gitops as an example where even the infrastructure piece or infrastructure configuration test environment configuration everything is stored in a git repository so that whenever you need to automate and run a test case you first set up the test environment from the script and then deploy your test cases in that environment so you can maintain a consistent test environment or you can identify a test environment pre configured it and use the same test environment every time reusing basically and last collaboration with developers devops allow testers to properly collaborate with their developer counterparts with their developer team okay so these are quite few benefits of devops read through it i'll give you one sorry i was on mute any question any queries anyone yeah so now next thing is about github i hope i am audible to all of you right now am i audible hello okay good so now the next module is github why github so as i told you earlier 
there are a lot many different DevOps tools you can use, like you can use Azure DevOps, you can use Jenkins, you can use Circle CI, Travis CI, and others. What is GitHub now? GitHub is a very popular DevOps platform. If you use GitHub, GitHub provide all the required features of DevOps. You do not have to use something like Jenkins or something like uh, uh, something like uh, Circle CI or Travis Travis CI. No, GitHub provides a proper DevOps platform, and yes, GitHub also provides version control system as well. GitHub repositories also. So GitHub is not just limited to only version control system anymore. GitHub provides all the DevOps tools and all the DevOps uh, processes built into it. So it is now emerging as a complete DevOps platform. So our second module is about GitHub. We will discuss few points about GitHub, a small introduction to GitHub, and then we will take a small break at around 11.45 or 11.50. Is that clear? Yeah. So what basically is a GitHub? GitHub is a complete open source software and DevOps platform. GitHub is a first choice for many open source projects. Rather, you will be surprised to know that many of open source projects are actually hosted on GitHub. To give you an example, look at this one. There is a public repository on GitHub. Username is Linus Stonewalls, and this is the repository which is Linux uh, kernel source code. So whichever Linux operating system you might be using or you might be heard of, all those operating systems are using this source code to build their Linux kernel. Kernel of Linux is a, a very basic core component of it. Okay, and rest of the operating system is built on top of it. So this kernel source code is already there on GitHub and you will notice there are more than 15,000 contributors to it. This is a true nature of open source software. Okay, so GitHub is a platform where open source developers collaborate and build open source software whose source code is available to everyone, to the general public. Okay, source code repository. Yes, that's right, Sivaraman. So, like this, lot many other technologies if you refer to, like if you are using a framework like Hibernate or Spring, Java framework, their source code is available on GitHub. If you are using JavaScript framework like Angular and React, even their source code is available on GitHub. There are lots of open source projects which are currently hosted on GitHub. So they use GitHub as a platform for their open source software. Okay. Then GitHub provides unlimited public and private Git repositories. Yes, that's right, Git repositories. That's the primary benefit or primary feature of GitHub anyways. GitHub provides unlimited number of public and private repositories both. That means you do not have to worry about basically uh, what is your current utilization of GitHub repositories, okay? You get unlimited number of them for free. Of course, earlier private repositories, there used to be a limit, but now GitHub has removed that limit and you can now use unlimited of public and private repositories both. You just need to sign up, create your GitHub account and use it for building your project or building your products later on. How many of you have used GitHub in past? Let me, maybe let's, Let's just say at least for uh, managing the source code or hosting the Git repository, it could be. Yep. But it is not just limited to source code management, or it is not just limited to only source code library, a source code repository. GitHub is much more than that. What other components GitHub provides? GitHub has GitHub repositories. 
GitHub also has a feature called code reviews. Code reviews using pull request. Pull request is how you integrate the code. Yes, that's right. That's Microsoft extending GitHub features. Yes, Naga. Microsoft purchased GitHub, uh, I guess, two years back, two to three years back, and now it's a Microsoft solution. And they are adding lot many additional features to GitHub. Like earlier, GitHub was just a version control system or a hosting provider. But now GitHub is much more than that. GitHub is a complete DevOps platform now. As of now, GitHub is emerging as a complete DevOps platform. Okay. So what is the other features? GitHub repositories, code review with pull request. GitHub also provides CI, CD, continuous integration and delivery de deployment workflows. And how GitHub manages to do that? GitHub has a component called GitHub Actions. GitHub Actions basically allows you to run GitHub workflows from the cloud or CI CD workflows from GitHub uh, environment, cloud hosted environment. It can build your code. Yes, DevSecOps. GitHub has lots of DevSecOps components. If you look at the last uh, sorry, second last and third last vulnerability assessment with depend about and SAST with code QL. Then these two feature features are actually DevSecOps features which have implemented security or integrated security into the, those workflows. Okay, so your CI CD workflows are much secure now on GitHub due to these additional components now. Next component here, vulnerability assessment with depend about. What is this? What exactly is vulnerability assessment? Do you know that very often software that you are building, whatever software you might be building, software you are building, it contains your code plus some third party libraries or some third party dependencies. Now there is a small possibility there is possibility that there is some kind of defect or some kind of loophole is there in one of the third party dependencies which might impact your software isn't it a third party dependency might impact your software the build the software you are building so what we should do then you should be able to identify such loopholes or you should be able to identify such security vulnerabilities and how do you do that you do that by identifying the vulnerabilities from third party packages rahul and naga oas 10 sql injection xss cr csrf those are security risks that will be evolved later right now i'm talking about third party dependencies okay Right now, I'm talking about third party dependencies. Like some of the third party components might have some vulnerabilities, and there should be a tool who will scan your dependencies and check if there is any package which contains these vulnerabilities. To give you an example, I will take you to a version control system used by Maven, mvnrepository.com. Let's try a very commonly used Java dependency called log4j okay this is log4j core which is most commonly used by many different java frameworks and did you notice there are vulnerabilities detected in log4j version 2.17 to log4j version 2.0 so all the version of log4j from 2.0 they have several vulnerabilities in them so what these tools will do they will just check your project now, if it is a Java project, they will open foam.xml. If it is a .NET project, they will open your 
packages, your CSPROJ file, C sharp project file. And then inside the file, it will check if you are using any dependency which has known vulnerabilities in them, which has any vulnerabilities detected in them. If you are using a particular version of dependency, like let's say log4j version 2.17, for example, or 2.16, then Dependa bot will identify it and give you a proper warning saying that some of the dependencies in your project has some vulnerabilities, known vulnerabilities, and you should probably replace them with a different Either you replace them with a different version or use a totally different alternative tool for them. This is called Dependabot, a feature from GitHub. To show you an example, I already have my own GitHub repository. And on my own GitHub repository, I already have several repositories where I have Dependabot alerts. Let me show you that. So here is my inbox on GitHub page. And here you will notice one of my repositories have the security vulnerability detected okay so you will notice this security vulnerability is detected in not just one but four different repositories that i have created earlier like for example just yesterday it has created this vulnerability report or depend about report and let's talk about it so it is saying github is saying that my four project four different repositories i'm using mysql connector where there is a very high level, a very serious vulnerability is detected, takeover vulnerability. And if I want more details about it, click on it. And it will give me more options here. It will give you a detailed description. And not just that, it will tell you which version of dependency you should use to patch this. So as per this, I'm using MySQL J connector version less than 8.2.0. And this vulnerability is fixed in version 8.2.0. So what should be my plan of action? How to make sure that my application will not have this vulnerability? What should I do? Any guess? Update the version. Yes, that's right. Update the nearest version. Maybe you should use 8.2.0 instead. And this vulnerability will be fixed so this is depend about i have to configure depend about by the way if you have a github repository you should configure depend about alerts for your repository either for all the repositories or for a specific repository you can do that you might have 10 15 different github repositories and you might configure depend about just for one of them you don't have to always define it for all the repositories no, there is no plugin required. Naga. Dependabot is a native feature available in GitHub. It's not supported via any kind of plugin. You don't need any plugin at all. Anyway, unlike something like Jenkins, which requires plugin for almost every activity, GitHub provides most of the things pre-built. Yes, I will show you how to configure that. But what is your first prerequisite for this? The first prerequisite, very simple. You must have a GitHub account to work on this. Is that clear? So you must have a GitHub account first. So let me show you how it is done, how it is configured. So to do this, let me take you to my GitHub account. I have already logged in into my GitHub account. And what I will do is I will go to the settings. And under settings, you will notice there are options here for code security and analysis. And under code security and analysis, you will see an options here. Dependency graph and Dependabot. You will notice one thing, Dependabot is already enabled for me. Okay, Dependabot is already enabled for me. And I have a button to disable it now. Now I'm not going to click this button because if I click, the, click this button, it will Disable depend about alert. So you just need GitHub account first of all. Log in into that GitHub account and then go and enable depend about alerts for you. Okay. You don't have to configure other features yet, like depend about version update. You can enable this one also. Now this is a small one. 
version update will not check for the vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities is checked by the previous one, security update. Version update will simply tell you whether you are using an outdated version of a dependency. It's very simple. Whether your dependency is outdated. Okay. It is just used to make sure that you are using an up to date kind of a dependency in your project. All the dependencies should be up to date. That's it. It's not about security vulnerability if you enable this one. Okay. If you want to know more about it, you can hit this button and it will explain you how to use this. If you use this kind of dependency, uh, 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 depend upon configuration, you have to provide your own configuration file. And inside this configuration file, you have to specify what should be the interval, like how frequently this scan should work or this scan should actually happen. Like here, you can see the default concept here or default setting here is to scan weekly, means once in a week. Okay, once in a week, depend upon will check if any of your dependency is outdated. And if your dependency is too old, yes, Sonar Cube can do that, but Sonar Cube is more for static code analysis, Swapnil. Okay, you, are mix, you people are mixing things a little bit. There is separate categories for that. Sonar Cube is static code analysis tool, right? Most of the time, Sonar Cube will go and find if your code is written perfectly fine or whether you have any loopholes in your code. What depend upon is doing, it's ignoring the code written by you, but instead it will check if third party dependencies that you have included in your code are correct and they have no kind of issues, any kind of vulnerabilities in them. Is that clear? So they complement each other. So please remember there is no competition between Dependa Bot and Sonar Cube. So if you are asking me, I'm already using Sonar Cube. Should I use Dependa Bot as well? I'll say yes, definitely yes. Okay. You should use both of them together, Sonar Cube and Dependa Bot, because they are looking at two different little aspects of the application. Okay. And you might need both of them. When we have SAS, static code analysis or static application security test using CodeQL. Now, now this is equivalent to SonarCube. But unfortunately here, SonarCube is much easier to implement or much easier to use than CodeQL. Okay. CodeQL, inside to CodeQL, SonarCube is much easier to configure. And they both will actually scan code written by you to check if it has any bad code or if you have followed all the best practices and written a quality code or not. OWASP is security, Bhavish. It will come later. Let me write down all the required testing utilities or all those required testing utilities in here. So basically, you have unit test. Then you have integration test. Okay. Then you have system test. System test. Then you have quite few performance tests. And then you have security test. Please remember one thing OWASP is used as a security test. Are, are you getting my point? Yes. Under security test, we have static code analysis. Where we use Sonar Cube, Sonar Cube, Sonar Cloud, or Four QL. Then we have something for package scanning. Package scanning means identifying security risk involved in third-party dependencies. This is where we get Dependa Bot. Or if you want some third-party service, 
then you can use white source fold, which actually I guess white source has uh, rebranded themselves as Mendsop. So they don't use this name anymore. Okay, they can also do package scanning. And then we have tools like OVAS, which is for infrastructure security most, uh, most of the time or peripheral security test. Okay, so these are multiple different categories. They are not alternatives to each other. Okay. And last, IDE with code spaces. What is code space? Code spaces as a concept provides you a development environment running on cloud. Yes, development environment on the cloud. So you don't have to actually install anything in your local machine. Your developers can use their iPads to develop the product. They just need internet and browser. You should be able to simply log in into your VS code like environment directly by using your web browser and start working on it. You don't have to ask your people or you don't have to set up all their machines properly. Install right version of Node.js, install right version of Java for them. No. Provide a ready to use dev environment directly to them. And this is called code spaces. GitHub code spaces. So what we will do now, we have discussed few top points here. It's almost 12 now. We'll take a small 10 minutes break here. Okay. And uh, then we will continue at 11, 11, 10. Is that fine, everyone? Hello? Sorry, not 11, 10. Sorry. It's already 11, 58. We'll, we will continue at 12, 10.
Okay, so welcome back. So we have received a question which is uh, related to GitHub as a product. Uh, like Microsoft has two products, DevOps and uh, GitHub. Yeah, we will discuss that at the end of the session, like why there are two products. Okay, so timer out. I'll just stop the timer now. I hope I'm audible to all of you right now. No. So let's now talk about further talk about GitHub as a platform. So very first thing GitHub provides is a version control system or GitHub repositories. Yes, GitHub provides lots of repositories. GitHub rep repositories basically allow us, GitHub repositories basically allow us to maintain our source code. Yeah, maintain our source code on cloud. Source code on cloud, what exactly is this term? Source code on cloud means your version control system, GitHub being a distributed version control system, you have a remote copy of your source code maintained on cloud, whereas you have the local copy on your local machine. Okay, and whenever you make any changes to your local copy, you push those changes to the remote Git repository, which is hosted somewhere on GitHub. Once you create a free GitHub account, you can create unlimited public repositories for yourself. Okay, and when when you say public repositories, that means people should be able to view the content of public repository. People should be able to read the content of public repository, but they will not be allowed to make any changes to such repositories. No modification, but it will allow you to use the repository anyways. Okay, so when you create a repository, you will be given two options. One, to first option to basically just, uh, you know, kind of use a public or private repository option. And then you can also initialize the repository with some kind of a readme file or some open source license or a set of git ignore files or git ignore. Git ignore basically means you can ignore some part or some certain kind of files on GitHub. Okay. Like, for example, if you are building a Node.js application, for example, if you are building a Node.js application, in a typical Node.js application, you may need to ignore entire, uh, what we call it, yeah. You may need to ignore the entire Node modules folder, for example, okay. So whatever is stored in node modules folder, I don't want to keep it in my version control system out there. Okay, that kind of activity you can perform in here. Anyways, once the repository is created, you can connect the repository to a local machine and start using it. Now, Amit has asked question, what is the difference between Git and GitHub? So the differences are, Git is the version control system and a command line interface. Yes, it is both. A version control system as well as a, a command line uh, interface. Git as a command line interface allows you to manage repositories on your local machine only. Whereas GitHub, on the other hand, is a hosting provider. GitHub basically allows you to keep remote copy of your repository on cloud. So to better understand this, what I'll do is I'll go back to the drawing di diagram right now. So we use git command line utility to manage local git repository. Okay. 
So for managing local Git repository, you use a tool called Git, which is basically a CLI. A CLI tool. And using the CLI tool, now CLI means character uh, command line interface. Now this Git CLI has multiple different commands to manage your local repository. Commands like clone, pull, push, commit, add, and so on. So Git is a command line tool that lets you manage local Git repository. On the other hand, GitHub is a platform that let you host Git repositories remotely. So remote Git repository. Now please remember one thing. Please remember one thing. Here, GitHub as a platform is currently hosted on certain cloud environment. And this GitHub platform is now owned by Microsoft. So here, GitHub is a kind of a hosting provider. Just the way you need hosting provider for your website, right? You need to host your website on some servers, right? Similarly, GitHub is a hosting provider for remote Git repository. And then you can sync your changes between remote repository and local repository. You do that by push and pull. Push means upload the changes from local to remote. Pull means download the changes from remote to local. Is that clear? So. I hope that's clear now, everyone. Okay. So you can create your own repository and then you can push and put pull your code from your local repository. So I will show you a very simple demo on how you can create your own GitHub repository and connect that GitHub repository with your local uh, Git repository. Now, in order to do this activity, what is actually required or what you need to have in your system is a very simple git command line interface. So if you have git installed in your local system, you can go ahead and use it like this. So let me show you this. Let's go to my GitHub repository first of all. OK. Here it is. What I will do is, OK, let's open GitHub. And inside github.com, I will just try creating a new repository. So here I'm using this new button. I'm creating a new repository. Let's give it a name. Uh, let's say GitOps demo. So this is my repository GitOps demo. And this name is available. So the complete URL would be github.com slash Mahendra Shinde GitOps demos provide some description. I can make this repository public so anybody can access it. And you can also add a readme file for it. But let's not add any readme file right now. Let's create a bare bone Git repository as of now. And then create the repository. So this should create an empty repository for me to use. Now this repository, if I want to use this repository, I have to create a local repository on my machine using Git command line and then connect it here. So how do I do that? Let me open my terminal. Terminal means I'm using a PowerShell terminal here. Uh, now, please remember my PowerShell terminal is little customized and I don't remember how I did this. Okay, so this is my PowerShell terminal. You can use command prompt also. Let's go to the D drive and on my D drive, D drive I have a separate folder for all my Git repositories, D colon slash Git. Now here, I'm going to create a new empty Git repository, an empty and local Git repository. How to do that? I'm using a Git command line tool called git with command in it. And here I'll create a new local repository called GitOps demo. So this is my local repository I'm going to create called GitOps repo, sorry, GitOps demos. And you will notice 
this is the new name of my GitHub uh, Git repository. Now, this one is my local Git repository. Please remember, name of the repository is GitOps demo, but the actual folder where repository is maintained, the database is maintained, is GitOps demo slash dot git. So, what is this folder then? GitOps tables. Now, GitOps tables is just your local folder. It's called working directory. In Git, it is called working directory. So let's get inside this working directory now. GitOps demos, and you will notice I'm right now on the master branch of my Git repository. You can verify that using Git status. Now I'm using Git CLI right now. So there is master branch and there are no commits. Let's use some of the examples here. We need a demo file, a readme file. So let's add a readme file. So you will notice there is one file here, readme.md. Git in it is already done. Readme. Now let's add the Git uh, readme file using git add command. This will add file to the local Git repository, but not yet. It is just added to the index. Remember, Git used two stage commit. That means first you need to add data or modified modified files to an index using git add command, and then you use git commit command to finalize those changes. If I use git status command, for example. You will notice it's saying there are no commits, but there is a new file and changes are ready to be committed. The changes here are ready to be committed. So I will just do a commit now. So this one is an empty repository right now. I did a commit. Yes. What I have to do next is the name of the master branch here is master, whereas this repository requires branch name to be made. So let's rename our current branch. Git branch hyphen m main. So my branch name is now updated to main branch. And now I'm going to add the remote repository. But before that, let's see a command called git remote hyphen v. Hyphen v means it will actually show you how many remote repositories you have. Sorry, it's remote, not remote. Git remote hyphen V is not giving me any response. That means there is no remote repository added. Let's add a new Git remote repository called origin. And here I'm going to use this URL of my GitHub repository. Now the URL begins with Git at the rate because I'm using SSH protocol, secure socket host, SSH, Linux based protocol for communication. Okay, done. Let's try the GitHub, GitHub uh, Git remote hyphen V, and this is your origin repository that connects to this local repository. Fine, now there is a link. And now the last command is git push. Please remember, if it is your first push, you must include hyphen U upstream and origin main. Origin is the name of remote repository and main is the branch name. You need this on your first push. Second push onward, you don't have to write this three words. You just have to write git push only afterwards. Okay, fine. So let's see if changes can be detected here. If I reload this page, you will notice now it shows a readme file with text GitOps demos. There is a readme file here, and this is the commit ID, empty repository. Any question, any queries on this? Pull and get this upstream origin. Yes, that's right. So basically, the association between local Git repository and remote report repository is of one to many or many to many. There is a possibility. There is a possibility that a single Git repository might be connected to more than one remote repository. Now, this might look little odd, but it is possible that. You have the Git repository on two different platforms. Like, for example, do you know about Bitbucket? Bitbucket also provides remote Git repositories. 
So Bitbucket is also a provider for remote repository. So what if your local Git repository is connected with two different remote repositories? Then there would be a logical name assigned to them. The first remote repository is given name origin. And second remote repository, you can give it some other name. Like for example, let's say I will call it origin 2 or something different than that. Are you getting my point? So whenever you do git push, and if it is your first push, you must mention which repository you are trying to push these changes into. Now your current git repository is configured as origin. Pull request and push request. The name assigned here for this repository, remote repository is origin. That's why you use git push hyphen u origin. And what is main? Main is the branch name. Is that clear? Hello? The interesting thing is, once you do a push, second time onward, there is no need to repeat that. You just have to write git push and enter. But as a best practice, as a best practice, always mention all the four parameters. What is benefit of mentioning all the four parameters? You know where you are pushing the changes. You are pushing changes to origin main branch, origin repository main branch, like that. Make help. It, it makes sense and it will make it will make sure you won't accidentally push your changes to a wrong repository if more than one repository is configured. Okay. Fine. Let's add some contents to it, right? Because empty folder is of no use. So what I'm actually going to do is I'll use Windows Explorer to copy some project into this. Just give me a minute. I do have created a, a demo project some time back, and I'm just planning to move that demo project here now. Just give me a minute. Wait, I was looking at a code which is very lengthy. Uh, let's use something which is very small and easy to implement. Sample on uh, uh, microservices basically. For this example application, I already have the Kubernetes manifest for this application also ready with me. So just give me a minute and I should be able to copy everything into this right repository now. Let's open the Windows Explorer and here I'm going to paste my sample project. Okay, good. So this is basically a very simple, uh, not simple actually, sorry. This is not a single, uh, uh, you can say, uh, this, this, this is not a, a single applic uh, application, actually. It is a microservices-based application with several components. There is Books API, 
there is a database as a as a service issues api library docs library gateway members api and kubernetes manifest for all of them okay kubernetes manifest for all of them is already created okay and in case if you want to test run this application locally i have created a script called run all and test so what i will do now i have created all those uh, you can say repository and everything i have done now inside the repository let's use the git status command wait a second Git status command and you will notice these are all the changes or these are all the files i have right now let's commit them first git add done and then git commit and here i'll say project files added or added project files so i created a new commit and after commit is created let me use git push command to push the changes to remote repository now this time i do not have to use hyphen u origin main because it's already connected let's go and check the repository here the github repository here and let's see what happens you will notice my github repository now has everything yes all the demo code how do you build this application now yes anyone how do you build the application now to build this application now what you need is a ci workflow what do you need is ci work okay so uh, the ci workflow in github is implemented with the help of github actions a tool called github actions so i will implement that as well how to use github actions looks like this particular project has too many different small independent microservices in there and we need to build them all so basically we have all these services and for all these services i have also created a file called docker compose.yml what i can do is i might use this docker compose.yml to properly build the entire application but looks like okay it's actually using my uh, existing image okay uh, this should be replaced with the a little bit of code changes to make sure it allows me to build the application on the fly so i might have to make some changes to the application here let's launch vs code and make the necessary changes It is also possible to build individual applications separately. You can create a GitHub action to build individual applications one by one or entire application together. Okay. So, like for example, I already have a Windows script to build everything at once. Okay. And uh, okay, this is actually wrong. Should have deleted this. and this one also is uh, not required yeah. fine so this is my docker compose file but there are few changes required because it's simply using the image name like this what i will do instead is i will use build parameter context path is uh, what is this project library books api so context path here would be books api and docker file docker file similarly i will have to provide this one here build context is now this application is members api so this should actually take members api and docker file name is not mandatory because anyway my docker files inside all one of them is already docker file docker file so i can just proceed to use that okay and this will basically allow me to build everything at once but please remember you can actually have more than one github action to build them together so what is github action github action is basically a tool that allows you to build all the projects here this one is issues api just adding forward slash at the end to make sure that it is recognized as 
a directory, okay, not as a file. And there, this one should be library docs, right? So library is library docs, okay. Library docs, okay. And then this one is to build it like this. The context here should be library gateway. Library gateway. This is for, for database. So let me build a database as well. And database would be database would be called uh, database. Yeah, folder name is only database. That's fine. Okay, so all the images and Docker Docker Compose file is already updated. Now, do you know that Docker as a container runtime allows you to build application container images? And if you use something like Docker Compose, you should be able to build multiple of them together. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, this particular repository I'm building right now is a public repository. I will share the URL with you. You can all access it. You won't be able to make any changes to it, but you should be able to read everything from the repository. Okay, so everything is set. Ideally, you should use some kind of placeholder, some kind of placeholder here to, to provide a customized image name. Okay, replace token or something like that and replace the image name instead of using a predefined image name. But let me just keep them as it is. And now all the changes I will push these changes to Docker Hub. Updated. Build context. A meaningful commit. Commit the changes. Now I'm using VS Code. So you don't have to use git command line to commit the changes and push them. Fine. So finally, after this is done, my project should be ready to build. And GitHub provides a very interesting feature called GitHub Actions. Let's see how to use that. So I have a project. Now for this project, how do I build it? So there is an option here called GitHub Actions. Did you notice this? This is my GitHub Actions. And inside GitHub Actions, you will notice because it already has Dependabots enabled, there were two workflows already run on my particular project. Did you notice that? That's because the depend about is enabled for my entire repositories or all the new repositories as well. You can check what workflows it has run and what was the response from it. So it looks like it was successfully run with no any kind of error as such. Okay. Let's say depend about updates. So these are the workflow run seven minutes ago. Good. Let's create a new workflow anyways. Now, what is a workflow? Workflow means the workflow is actually the CI CD workflow. And you will notice one thing. There are some templates available here. Did you notice the templates? Hello? Now, this makes it interesting. This one makes it interesting. You can use a pre-created template. Like, for example, for this one, you might use public Docker container to build a test and push Docker images to GitHub packages. Or you can use this one, build a Docker image, any one of them. Or you can even use Java package. If you use Java package, then you have to use Maven workflow to build the application. Now, ideally, you should create a separate workflow for every single application within this Git repository. Right, but I will not do that. Let's use this. When I hit configure, it will create the YAML workflow. Now, this YAML workflow here, you will notice the workflow here is very similar to how Azure Pipeline workflow is created. Okay, so this is the name of the workflow. You can rename it, by the way. And let's call it build all. You can set the schedule. You want the workflow to run on a certain intervals. So you can do that. You can provide the branch name, you can provide the tags, and then you can also provide the name of your container registry where you wish to update and push this Docker images to. 
After that, this is the build agent. You provide the build agent name as Ubuntu latest, for example, permissions you set and read write permissions. Steps would be checkout. Checkout step will simply get the source code into a temporary build agent, install some in interesting tools, cosine tool, for example, signing tool, set up Docker build, set up or login into GitHub registry, GitHub registry on uh, uh, Docker GitHub registry, and then get the metadata and build and push the images. Now, this is the step that will actually be responsible for building and push the images, but looks like looks like this will actually work fine if you have the Docker file directly in the root of your uh, registry or root file of your registry. Unfortunately, this will not work for my current project. I'll tell you the reason for that. For current project, there is not one single Docker file, but there are multiple Docker files, okay, in each folder, basically. We can't unfortunate, we can't fortunately use this. Let me cancel this. Let's go to the action. Uh, I guess I should have used a, a application which has only one single. Yeah, this is this is not a Docker file, Sivaraman. It was an action file, GitHub workflow. Docker file looks different. Let's use this basic Docker image build. Let's see how it looks. So basically, image CI, build tool, and here you can provide the Docker file name. Yeah, this is better now. This is better. So let's say I name this as build all. And now what I will do in this CI CD workflow is that I will write down here the required steps. Like for example, check out the project and build the image. Now you will notice here the name here is build Docker image and it's just providing the Docker file name. What I will do now, first of all, let me remove this image tag. Why? Because inside my Docker, inside my Docker Compose file, image names are already present. And I'm going to repeat this task for all the container images. Okay. So like for example, if you look at my sample application, my sample application right now has multiple services. Like for example, I have a service called database. Now where is my database? This, no, this is library docs. This is gateway and this is database. So for example, my database is in database folder. So what I will do here, I'll say build the Docker image for common database, okay? And here, Docker file name would be this, database slash Docker file. Are you getting my point? Similarly, in order to build my other application, let's say books services. Where is my book service? This is books API. So for books API, I will use this books API dot API. This is one of my microservice. Let's do this. Okay. Now please remember, if it is a containerized build, you just need Docker build command to build the containers. Are you getting my point? And same way, you can build other applications like member service. Let me repeat again. Best practice would be to have a different action for each project. Are you getting my point? You should have a different action for common database, different for books API, different for member API. Okay. After you do this, what you should do is you should also publish this Docker images to your local repository, but I'm not doing that right now. I've just wanted to use continuous integration workflow. So this is my continuous integration workflow created in GitHub. It's a YAML file. Unlike Azure DevOps, there is no traditional option. All the options are for building the images only. So let's say we build the image, and what I will do is I will commit the changes from here. This will create the workflow. This will create the workflow for me. And after I commit the workflow, the changes will automatically start. It will automatically start. Uh, uh, you know, the, the workflow execution because we did a new commit. 
let's go back to the GitHub Actions and check if the commit, uh, the build process has already started. Did you notice the build process here? Build has already started, but looks like there was some issue with my build. Let me check what it is. It was trying to build a common database, but looks like failed to resolve varlib build kit db, no such file or directory. Why is that? Is there some issue with my database folder? Inside db, there was files that needed to be initialized, okay? Where is the database container? I guess I have just some con configuration issues with my database configuration. Database does have a DB folder and it should be able to pick the contents from that DB folder, right? And because of this, the build has failed, unfortunately, because it did not continue with the next part. So, okay, I got it. The, the, the issue is with the dot parameter here. I know what is an issue here. I can fix it now. What I will do is I will edit the workflow file. I will edit the workflow file and let me tell you what changes I need for this workflow. View the workflow file. And here, let's edit and what is actually needed here is the build context is this dot so instead of using the file parameter what you should do is you should write database here as a build context so let me fix this so it should take this folder as a build context there was an issue with the build command i'm just trying to fix that fine and with some changes, I will commit the changes. And every time I commit the changes, it will actually trigger my pipeline again and again. The reason is the default trigger here is every push or any changes to main repository should trigger this workflow. So let's see the workflow has again begun. Let's wait for it. The build process has begun now. It will take some time, but ultimately the build should be completed in some time. This is how it works looks like there were multiple errors uh, what is that fail to solve fail to calculate checksum of reference fail to walk tmp build kit target okay i got it i got it this for this particular project to work the deposit the, the applications must be built it's missing the target folder i know how to fix that just give me a minute what i will do is In order to build the container, it requires all the applications to have their target directories, okay, ready. So let's use the reusable script I have created to build all the applications at once. Now this is going to take some time. It will actually build my entire application, okay. Uh, you are not able to see this here, but it's actually launching all these applications in their own terminal windows. And I'm basically doing a Maven build in uh, six, seven different terminal windows parallelly. Like this one here is building books API, for example. Let them all finish building process. Uh, looks like it's a Maven project, so it has to resolve all the dependencies and all. Just wait for it.
uh, I'm doing a Git pull and Git push because uh, I have made some changes to the repository, right? By creating a workflow and those changes were not updated to local machine. So locally, I built all the application and send them, send the binary files once again. Now this should fix it. And let's see, repeat the workflow now. Let's go back to the action. We are currently looking at an action called build all action. We did some push operations here on this. Okay, everything is up to date and this has run 20 seconds back. Looks like this project do have some kind of uh, build issues right now for the project. Check some target no directory found. Okay, why is this happening? I guess. I guess the, this project has git ignore file, which is ignoring all the target folders and binaries, basically. Just give me a minute. I can instead use a different project, which is very small. And it has only an application and database, only two services with Kubernetes deployment files ready. I will instead use this project, this repository. Let me share the repository URL with you. Okay. There are only two projects. First is the database, and second one is a Java application called API. Let me check the action. Okay, there is no GitHub action. I'll create a GitHub action that will actually create a Docker container images for this. I'm using a different project because my previous project has multiple build issues basically, and we don't have time to fix all the build issues right now. So this is it. I'm just trying to build the container image here. The repository I'm using right now, this repository uh, contains a Spring Boot application. Okay. And Wait a second. There is a database and there is application. If you look at database, DB has Docker file here in a DB folder. Okay, and application API app has Docker file in it here. It's a Docker file for API app. So accordingly, I will make the changes now. I need two build jobs here, just two build jobs. Build the Database image. First, I will build the database image using DB folder name, Docker build DB. And then I will use a tag. For the tag, I will use tag my app my, my DB colon. Wait a second. Let's check what was the original content. Yeah. I will just to use here db as a folder file docker file this is not required actually default all the file names are docker file no need to specify that and here i'll say the image name would be my db dollar round bracket doc uh, date percentage so my database will have a timestamp afterwards to identify which image it was or what was the image number instead of timestamp you can also provide some other property here like you can also just drop it and keep it just my DB. So this will become the target image name. So with this, I'm trying to build a Docker image. Build the database image, sorry. So with this, this should build the database image. Let me add one more step here and build the application image. For application image, I will just call it Docker build app and tag is my app. So I will have my DB and my app, two images in here. Is that clear? I will have two images in here. If you remove the tag, it can also take the Docker file. It can also take the image name from the uh, uh, Docker Compose file or from the other script file. So this should build both the application images and publish them to me, publish them for me. Let's commit the changes, commit, and let's wait for the workflow execution. I'll go to the actions parameter. 
Now, Kali Image CI was the workflow I created, and you can see it is currently in progress. The build is happening, right? Let's wait for it. Looks like it's building that database image first, and after database image, it will go and build the application image. Just have to do a wait and watch. Okay, so looks like first image is built, but there is an application image. Okay, I got it. I guess the folder name is not accurate. The name of the folder was not app, it was API app. Let me verify that. Name is API hyphen app. Fine. View the workflow. Edit and let's fix this. See, this is an issue with automation. In automation, if you make any mistake, you have to go and edit everything and commit the changes once again. And being a version control system, it will be tracked. All the changes will be recorded in the uh, in the commit log. Okay, so this will repeat the entire build process. And let's wait for a few minutes for the build to complete. Successfully completed, Swapnil, these artifacts will be cached into its own temporary storage. But guess what? We cannot depend on that temporary storage because it might get erased later on. So, what we do is after the build is successful, we should add another command git, uh, sorry, docker publish command or docker, uh, docker push command to upload these container images somewhere on your container registry. Are you getting my point? Hello. You should upload these container images to a container registry so that no matter whether you even delete the workflow or delete the GitHub project, your final container images should be still accessible to you. Yeah. Your container images must always be accessible to you, even after you delete entire uh, source code project or entire source code. So the build is successful finally, and I have done the CI part. Good. Now CD workflow. You take the application and deploy it on the target environment. Now for deployment pipeline, please remember in Azure pipeline, we have pipeline and we have release pipeline. In GitHub, however, there is no separate release pipeline. GitHub, you can either do delivery and deployment in the same pipeline, okay? Same pipeline will be used for delivery, same pipeline will be used for build. 
or you can have two different pipelines created okay one to do delivery and one to do a build okay but in case if you create two different pipelines make sure you invoke them in a proper sequence like your delivery pipeline should execute only after your build pipeline successfully complete and for delivery pipeline you do not actually need the source code uh, repository at all or you don't actually have to use checkout for delivery pipeline unless you are doing gitops which is our next module to discuss i hope the ci part is clear now you can check my repository if you visit this repository spring rest docker you can see the sample project there you can explore it for a few minutes you will see there is a docker compose file that will explain you how to run this application in dev test environment and there is a db folder which contains database and api app which contains application can you explore it for a few minutes We will either create another YAML file for de delivery deployment, or you can include the steps in the same YAML file.
Fine. So let's now talk about DevOps. So we have discussed DevOps, we have discussed GitHub. Now about GitOps. What basically is a GitOps? So let's continue back to the presentation. We did talk about GitHub, GitHub Actions. GitHub Actions basically uh, behind the scene use some kind of systems. We call them runners, GitHub runners. GitHub, GitHub runners are basically build agents where you will actually go and run your GitHub workflows. Now, a typical workflow is when you check out the code, you build the application, publish the application on container registry, and get done with it. That is integration workflow, which looks like this. Now, this is, for example, an integration workflow for building a Java application, not using Docker, but plain Maven. And there are several examples. You can also use code spaces, which is basically an IDE. Okay, we'll not do the code space demo here because our main topic here is uh, this thing, GitHub. So GitHub has other features like GitHub depend upon, for example, for the newly created repository or for this existing repository, if you want to enable uh, depend upon, you can just go to settings. From settings, you can go for code security and analysis. From code security and analysis, you just have to enable dependency graph and automatic dependency detection. Okay, this is already enabled for this repository. Fine. Now the next is GitOps. What is GitOps now? Heard about GitOps anyone? GitOps is a new pattern, a relatively new pattern, a relatively new trend. Now, why I'm using term relatively? Because it's already three to four years old. Anyway, so GitOps is a trend where you use all the artifacts, deployment artifacts also in Git repository. Earlier, we used to keep only source code in Git repository, but now you will keep all the deployment artifacts as well into a Git repository. So what is it? GitOps is basically implementing the continuous deployment for cloud native application. GitOps is used in cloud native application. Any idea what is cloud native application? Have you heard the term before? Cloud native? Anyone? Cloud native means application which is made for cloud and it has all the required, you can say, characteristics of cloud. It can benefit from cloud scalability, cloud agility, and automation both. So we use Git repository as a single source for application configuration and infrastructure as a code both. Now, what is infrastructure as a code? Infrastructure as, as a code means Define the entire infrastructure required for your application is in form of a declaration file or a configuration file. Okay, that way, whenever you need to make any changes to that particular configuration, you can make the changes directly inside the version control system itself. Okay, you can make changes from the version control system itself. This application, this particular configuration will be stored in the repository. Now, my current repository already is capable of GitOps. I will show you where it is or what configuration files are stored. If you look at the main repository file, there are two important configuration files I have. One is Docker Compose and one is 
KHS deployment. Docker Compose.yml simply explained me how I can deploy this application on a local machine in form of two containers, a database container and app container. I can use Docker file to deploy and test my application, deploy and run application in dev and QA environment. Okay, only in dev and QA environment. Okay. Here it is, Docker Compose. Then another file that I have here for final production deployment is KHS deployment, Kubernetes deployment. Now you will notice all the declaration files are there for application, service, configuration, and DB configuration as well. This is example of app configuration, for example. Application configuration is right there created in YAML file. So whenever you need any changes to this particular configuration, you should be able to do that. You should be able to make all the required configuration to this application as and when required. Is that clear? So this particular project is already ready for GitOps, but it uses two interesting tools. One is Docker for container build, and second one is Kubernetes for final deployment. Now, GitOps is very popularly used for containerized workflows because containers are cloud native applications, born in cloud, kind of. Now, what are the key principles of GitOps? First key principle is declarative description. I have defined everything in some kind of configuration file. It could be just anything. Okay, uh, a CONF conf file or INI file, something like that. Okay. Version and immutable. What is version and immutable? The configurations stored in Git, in Git version control system, which gives you one benefit. Whatever changes you make to the configuration, you need to make the changes, you make the commit, and you need to push the changes. That means they will be tracked. Are you getting my point? Whatever changes you make to the configuration will could be easily tracked. Okay. And in case if you want to roll back to the older version, you should be able to do that. Just the way you can roll back your source code, you should be able to roll back to your older configuration as well. They are pulled automatically. Why pulled automatically? Because all the configuration is right there in the same GitHub repository. Now again, some of you might ask, is it good to keep both application source code and its deployment configuration in the same repository? Now it depends on you. You can either keep it in the same repository or you can keep them in two different repositories. Both the way it works fine. But obviously if you keep them in two different repositories, then source code repository will have build workflow and configuration file repository or deployment repository will have deployment workflow only. Make sense? Yeah. Continuous reconciliation. Continuously reconcile the state of environment. Now, this is also example of desired state configuration. So if you make any changes to the configuration file, your application will be automatically updated based on that. So this is GitOps for cloud native application. One prerequisite, as the name suggests, you must use Git repositories for GitOps to work. Version control system, you should use Okay. Number two, this is made for containerized application. Most of the GitOps tools are actually made for Kubernetes deployment. Okay. Now, what are the benefits of GitOps? Increased speed, 
provide better stability and reliability of application, provide better collaboration and better auditability and compliance. If somebody has doubts about how your application will be deployed on Kubernetes, they can just go and read those YAML files. Like this is how my deployment, this is how my database is going to be deployed using this deployment YAML file. So if required, you can audit or you can check compatibility, right, of these YAML files. And if everything is fine, go ahead and deploy it. It's like that. Uh, GitOps. Uh, GitOps is a con con GitOps is actually considered as a generic concept. There are multiple implementation of GitOps. Like for example, the one we will use today is Argo CD. Okay, but there could be other GitOps uh, tools available in market. Okay, Argo CD is just one example. Another one I can tell you. There is one. Uh, uh, I guess Red Hat has introduced something which is based on Kubernetes. What do they call it? Uh, I just forgot the name. OpenShift, which also provides GitOps capabilities, okay? which is installed directly on top of Kubernetes cluster. And for this one, for this purpose, however, I have recently created an AKS cluster, a Kubernetes cluster on Microsoft Cloud, and I'm going to use this for my GitOps demo here. Fine. So here we are. So developer will make the changes to the pipeline or developer will make a code commit. A CI pipeline, continuous integration pipeline will build it, add it to the main branch. CD workflow will begin and it will deploy the application. Okay. Now your CD pipeline, the traditional CD pipeline will be triggered every time build is completed but if you use gitops if you use gitops your deployment will be triggered every time user makes changes to the configuration file is that clear that means if somebody changes the database username and password it should trigger the deployment it will trigger deployment of both database and application both will be redeployed because you made some changes to your configuration file. Okay. Now, what are the tools available? There are few options available to us. There is Flux, there is Argo, Jenkins X, and Tekton. Okay. So these are some of the GitOps tools available in market. And for this particular uh, station, I have selected Argo CD as a CICD tool, uh, sorry, as a GitOps tool for us. How do you set up the environment? Very first thing you need is Git. Second thing that you need is Kubernetes cluster. You need the GitOps tool like Argo CD. You need to have the configuration files ready and you should be able to connect your Git repository to the cluster. So let me show you what I'm going to do now. I already have a Kubernetes cluster with me. And I will connect my current context. I will connect my kubectl with it. Right now, if you try kubectl cluster info, it will say I'm not connected to any container cluster at all. I'm getting multiple errors, by the way. Okay, demo, GitOps, DNS. No such host. Fine, no worries. I will just fix this now. I try to open my Kubernetes configuration file, cube config. So it looks like in my cube config, there is already one Kubernetes cluster is already registered here. One is Docker desktop and the other one is, okay, I guess this is an old context which I don't need anymore. What I will do is I will just delete it Wait a second. 
let's not delete it because this is being a yaml file if any invalid changes i make that might uh, make it difficult for me to use it later on okay right now i have a kubernetes cluster created somewhere on my system on my azure subscription let's see how many of them are there so this is my aks cluster called demo aks 101 and it is in resource group demo rg so let's download the credentials for it aks get credentials for resource group resource group is demo hyphen rg and name of the kubernetes cluster is demo aks 101 and i need admin user so let's download the credentials uh, looks like it should be double hyphen admin not single double hyphen admin so this will get me the kubernetes credentials and now i should be able to access my kubernetes cluster so let me show you in brief how my kubernetes cluster looks alike so this is my kubernetes cluster running on microsoft azure cloud and i'll show you how many nodes i do have right now i have a kubernetes cluster with multiple nodes you will notice there are two nodes right now and this is a highly scaled kind of Kubernetes cluster, which will automatically scale itself up and down. Okay, it is auto scaled one. Fine, so this is ready. What is the next step to do? Next step is now to simply download uh, uh, a tool called Argo CD and use it here. Let me show you where you can find Argo CD. Argo CD. They have their own website where they will give you, they, they, they gave us all the detailed instructions on how to deploy it on Kubernetes. So Argo CD has a UI like this. Okay. So what I will do is let's see how to get the Argo CD on your local machine. There are multiple ways you can do that. You can download the Argo, Argo CD CLI directly. Uh, from its GitHub releases, or you can install it using this approach here, command line approach. So first you will create a separate dedicated namespace for it, and there is a YAML file that will help you download Argo CD in your Kubernetes cluster. So let me just copy this command and try this from my terminal. Here in the terminal, I will try to copy paste this command anyways. First command created namespace and second command, I'm installing Argo CD in my Azure Kubernetes service cluster, AKS cluster. Being on cloud, it is much faster than my local Kubernetes cluster. Okay, yes, done. What next? Now that Argo CD is installed, We can now configure the Argo CD login. You also need Argo CD CLI, by the way, a CLI command line interface that you need to install in your local machine. There is a URL given to download a command line environment of Argo CD compatible for your operating system. So if I click on this URL, it will take me to a page where you can download Argo CD CLI for your particular operating system. Right now, I'm using Windows machine, I'm using Windows 11. So I should use this Argo CD for Windows. So let's download this Argo CD for Windows, an exe file. Let's see how fast it will be in, uh, it will be downloaded. And once it is done, I will just launch the exe file. Wait for it. Uh, this is basically the home page of Argo CD. Getting started page. I will put it here. But remember, you need to have a Git repository and you need to have a Kubernetes cluster ready with you. Okay. So I guess installation, we should do the installation right now. I try to call the exe file. Let's see what happens now. As usual, Microsoft is Microsoft Windows says that this is some third party exe and you should not run because it's suspicious for Microsoft. But what I will do is I will go ahead and anyway run it. Let's click on more info, run anyway. 
okay so it's fine it looks like it's executable and uh, it did not actually give me any prompt because uh, it was simple cli no worries what i will do is i'll copy this file to a small folder from where i can access it later on so right now in, in a terminal i will go to a downloads folder and inside downloads the file name was argo cd so let's copy this file argo cd windows xx64 and i will copy this to my dedicated tools folder wait a second looks like tools folder do not exist I have a folder for Helm created some time back. I will copy it to that folder. The reason I'm, I'm actually copying it to this particular folder is because it's already part of my environment path entries or environment variable called path. So this is it. Also, I don't want the CLI to be named Argo CD Windows X64. Let's rename it to Argo CD.exe. That will make it easier, right? Oh, I'm using wrong command. It's a rename. Fine. Let's try it now. Argo cd.exe help. So this is the help from Argo CD. And now in order to install Argo CD and use it, these are the commands like Argo account, Argo admin, Argo app. You can use this to create new application. Argo app set, certificate, cluster, and other details. I'm going to use this option right now. Argo login. This allows me to access the Argo console. So let's say I'll write Argo CD login. Wait a second. Argo CD login has parameters required. Okay, server URL we need to provide. Okay, looks like by default it's not available. So we need to make the Argo CD available from outside by changing the service type to load balancer. And then, or, okay, instead of this, I guess this would be better. I will just make my Argo CD accessible on this particular port, local port 8080. How to do that? Let's keep one additional PowerShell prompt or command prompt open. And inside this prompt, I will run this command to keep my Argo CD uh, port in, wait a second, looks like my port 8080 is already in use. No worries, I will change the port number to 8000 then. Let's say I'm using port 8000, unable to forward because pod is not running. Okay, I got it. Looks like my Argo CD is not yet deployed, probably. Get pods from namespace. from namespace argo cd so it looks like all the pods are currently in pending state and unless they are not up and running i will not be able to reach my argo cd dashboard so let me just quickly check this why they are giving me trouble describe the pod name of the pod from namespace argo cd let's wait for it pod did not deploy the trigger because node 1 has untolerated tent and node 2 has untolerated -toler tent. Looks like I need my AKS cluster to be uh, ready. I'll, I'll do that. Just a minute. Loop CTL get node. Let's see how many nodes were already available to me. Yes, and these two are AKS agent pool node ready. Okay, fine. Just give me a minute. What I'm trying to do is I'm just increasing number of nodes in my Kubernetes cluster now. Kubernetes is basically a container runtime, sorry, container orchestrator 
which allows you to manage multiple containers at once. Okay, looks like I'm currently running a system agent pool and my user agent pool has zero nodes where Argo CD will be deployed. So I will just scale this node pool manually to have minimum two worker nodes. I need minimum two worker nodes here. This will take few minutes and within few minutes, my Kubernetes cluster should have enough nodes to deploy Argo CD. Wait a second, what is this now? Requested VM size SKU is not available in location. Looks like my virtual machine size is not compatible here. Okay, just give me a minute. I'll configure this. I guess better would be to just create a new node pool. User pool Ubuntu Linux and when it is version I'm using right now is 1.29.0. Give me a Fine, I'm just deploying one additional instance. With cloud, you know, you always have some kind of resource quota and you will not be able to deploy anything beyond that particular resource quota. I guess B2MS machines should be enough for me. And number of nodes would be just two nodes. Okay. So basically what we are doing is we have deployed a Kubernetes cluster and inside that Kubernetes cluster, I'll be deploying my uh, Argo CD environment. And once Argo CD environment is deployed, I will use that deployed Argo CD environment to deploy my application or to uh, set up a automated deployment of my application. Wait for it, looks like the Agent pool is getting scaled right now. There is a system pool and there is a user pool. This pool is getting created. This one has zero. This one has two nodes. Sorry. Once the node becomes ready, I will use uh, Argo CD installation command. Installation is done. It's just waiting for the nodes to be available. This is one of the interesting feature of Kubernetes. If the nodes are not available, your deployment will wait for it. Uh, let's see if it is detected by kubectl, by the way. Get node and it is still showing these two nodes only. The newly added uh, basic nodes are not yet registered here. Only when they are registered, application deployment will continue in that in there. So they are all pending right now. They are just waiting for nodes to be made available. Let's take a small five minute break while it is installing the node.
see at least one node is available now. So let's go back and check this. Okay, looks like some of the containers have started creating, but uh, due to unavailability of nodes and all, some of them have failed already. Okay, now I guess within few seconds, Argo CD should be up and running, running uh, because four port containers are deployed and three are pending. Argo CD completely runs within your Kubernetes cluster. And it uses pool based model, means pull the configuration and deploy application on Kubernetes. Okay, while it is initializing, let me explain you this with the help of a diagram. So what Argo CD or what uh, this approach will do? First, you have a Kubernetes cluster here. Okay, you have a Kubernetes cluster. On this Kubernetes cluster, you have some space to deploy your workload. So you split it into two parts. First one is your workload. This is dedicated space for workload deployment. Workload deployment. And then Another space, or let's say another namespace for Argo CD. Okay, so this is for Argo CD. So you have a namespace for Argo CD and you have a namespace for your application workflow. Now, what you need is a version control system where deployment artifacts, a Git version control system, Git repository, where you have your configuration files, okay? You have your Kubernetes manifest. Kubernetes manifest or YAML file on this Git repository. Now what Argo CD will do, Argo CD will periodically check if this Kubernetes manifest have been modified recently. And if there is any change detected in Kubernetes manifest, it will deploy application here based on these changes. Is that clear? So now, every time you want to make any changes or every time you want to redeploy your application, just go and make some changes to this manifest file and Argo CD will pull the changes and deploy them on Kubernetes. This is how it works. And while doing this, Argo CD will completely sit on the same Kubernetes cluster where workload is getting deployed. Okay, let me go and check now. I guess Argo CD must be installed and ready. Some of the pods are still initializing. This is a one time activity basically. Installing Argo CD on Kubernetes cluster is one time activity. Once it is done, later on it will manage all your projects. Also, need to check why it is taking so long for this repo server pod to initialize. So what I will do is I'll just try to describe it. Okay, it is just trying to download the image. Copy util, okay, fine. And uh, initially there was a tent, but it got assigned. So I guess it should be ready in some time. We can also check the logs for this particular pod. QCTL logs. Okay, it's just waiting to start, fine. I'm not sure why it's taking so long, but anyways, let me show you the login page now. How do you access a login page? You write a login page like this, localhost 8000, but before that you have to make sure that it is accessible on port 8000. So let me use the kubectl port forward command to access Argo CD login page on my local port 8000. After that, I will run this command to actually access the login page. Looks like it's not possible. Okay, sorry. This is a local installation and I'm using self-signed certificate. Press Y to accept self-signed certificate and then you have to provide the username and password. The default username and password is Argo Argo. With this, wait a second, I guess it's not accepting the Argo as a username and password. 
maybe the default username and password is not argo argo admin okay i got it login using cli you can login using argo cd admin initial password hyphen n argo cd right this is the initial password so initial password i can actually extract it from the installation namespace or i can just use this command from the cli so the initial password for argo cd is this this is the username sorry this is password and username is admin so let's try the login command once again there is one more way you can log in it is available to you on localhost 8000 port so what i can instead do is let's open localhost 8000 and you will get this page this is because it's using self signed certificate except there is sign in it and this is argo cd my username for argo cd is admin i my password my password is already displayed here let me just copy this and yeah in case if you require you can reset the password after successful login so now argo cd is up and running on your kubernetes cluster and here i can now create my new application on the same kubernetes cluster where argo cd is currently running so to show you an example here if i now type kubectl get deployments right you will notice the number of deployments here are either in kube system namespace or argo cd namespace that means either they are kubernetes components or argo cd component how do i deploy an application now now pay attention this is how kitops work create an application you provide your application a name let's call it app1 you give it a project name let's say it is a sample project sync policy you can set it to manual or automatic automatic sync means it will keep syncing or it will keep checking if there is any change detected do you want to prune the resource what is prune resource means if you delete the deployment you, you should delete all the resources as well okay there are several options here like you can also auto create the namespace if required then you have to provide the source code repository url now this becomes easier now what i will do is i will just give it repository url of my uh, github repository wait a second this time i'm using Bring rest docker compose so this repository i'm going to use now so let's say my repository is here this is the url please make sure that repository is either public repository or if it is not public repository then you should have credentials to access it so this is a git repository here then path what do you mean by path the repository contains a separate folder called kts deployment did you notice that and this kts deployment is the folder which contains my kubernetes deployment files is it deployment or deployments plural no it's singular deployment so what argo will do argo will check if there are any files in this kts deployment folder kubernetes manifest and it will go and implement them now where to implement it let's say i want this to be deployed in the current kubernetes cluster so this is how you access the current kubernetes cluster from inside argo cd and then provide the namespace let's call it app1 namespace so it will be deployed in app1 namespace is that clear hello further customization also you can do so i am creating an application in argo cd what you need is kubernetes cluster and a ready made kubernetes manifest file by the way all this thing could also be written in a yaml syntax this is how you can define it in a yaml syntax and it looks like a typical kubernetes yaml file yeah that's right so what i will do is uh, destination name let's give it a name app1 namespace is my app server is so and so sorry not app1 this is basically cluster name aks 101 fine let me save the changes and now scroll up hit the create button 
Now this will create a new application based on this. Wait a second, what is it? App is not allowed in product sample project or project does not exist. Okay, I got it. So let me first create a project and then the application inside a project. So what I'll do is, it's a default project, right? Application name is app one, default project, automatic sync, rune resource. You can also enable cell fields, so you should not be able to delete it manually. Repository URL, I will hit the repository URL like this. And default Kubernetes namespace, app one. Rest everything is fine. Let's go ahead and create the application now. Now this will create the application now on Argo CD. Or this will start, or this will request Argo CD to create an application for us. Oh, wait a second, path is missing, right? What was that? AATS manifest. Oh, sorry, KATS deployment, not manifest. So that's the folder name. Create, and this should create the application for us. Is there any error now? Okay, so looks like it is up. Now it is trying to sync it. What Argo CD will now do is it will read all the YAML files and accordingly deploy your application. You will notice this is all it requires. It is going to deploy now a DB config, app service, DB service, app, and database. Are you getting my point? Right now it is out of sync. You can see the details about commit history and everything. It is right now syncing. Syncing means it is trying to read the configuration and implement them in Kubernetes cluster. This way, whenever you need to update this deployment, just go to your Git repository and make the changes to the YAML files directly, Kubernetes YAML file directly, and it will do the deployment. Now, what is use of this? Remember my first demo that I selected had seven to eight different services. It was a microservice architecture. It, it is a useful thing for that kind of complex application where your application is made up of 10, 15 different services. And manually managing all of them is a bit uh, slower process. Here, you should use Argo when your application is a distributed application made up of several uh, tens of microservices and Argo CD will deploy them or sync them automatically whenever change is detected. Any questions, anyone? This is called GitOps. So we had a DevOps. DevOps means it's a configuration management. Yes, Swapnil, but it is mix of two things right now. It's not just configuration management. It actually provides automated deployment. That means there is no need for you to hit a deploy button. Make changes to configuration and your deployment will update automatically. So this is more like infrastructure as a code and configuration management both. Yes, Pavish. So this is a really nice tool. So yes, like that. Now, by the way, if you want a proper IAC, infrastructure as a configuration, what you should do is you could even include some steps to set up Kubernetes cluster itself. Right now it is limited because what it is doing is it will work if your Kubernetes cluster already exists and what you are actually creating on top of it is your application, its service, its config, its secret, its load balancer and all that. Yes, you could use uh, Terraform, third party tool Terraform or you can use Azure Bicep template or Azure ARM template to even deploy Kubernetes cluster on the top. You can automate that as well. Is that clear? Now you notice one thing, my GitHub pipeline or my GitHub action is simply doing build, not deployment. Deployment is taken care of by Argo CD. Is that clear? But please remember, as the name suggests, Argo CD will just do the deployment. It will never build your application. For building your application, you have to do that using some other CI tool like GitHub action, Azure pipeline, Jenkins, etc. 
it is only deployment that's why they specifically say their name is argo cd continuous deployment only and what are the two requirements you must have a git repository and you must have a kubernetes cluster any questions anyone any questions queries looks like application deployment is taking a bit longer uh, i should be able to see the complete log like this one is out of sync resource is not found uh, in cluster v1 secret db config this was the desired manifest there is also an option available to force sync this what i will do is hit the sync button manually let's say i want to do it prune the existing resources and redeploy the everything prune means delete existing and another operation is already running looks like the old sync operation has not done yet okay i got it i tried this while namespace is not available okay it's, it does not have a namespace with name app 1 fine i'll do this cube ctl create a namespace app 1 cube ctl get all from namespace app 1 let's see what all things it will deploy now should work now i have created oh yes now it is succeeded it was waiting for that namespace i didn't have the namespace created and now it is all ready you can see this db config app service db service you can see all the internal component it creates even the endpoints and it gives you a very nice visual uh, you can say representation of your entire application running on kubernetes cluster whenever whenever we work kubernetes many a time people complain using kubernetes cli is fine kubectl but is it possible to get a live gui view of application as if if you want to test this without as your subscription there is another option what you can do is you can use docker desktop docker desktop you can install docker desktop in your local machine inside docker desktop you get kubernetes and use docker desktop kubernetes to deploy both argo cd and your application yes swapnil you can also use minikube instead of docker desktop basically you need a kubernetes cluster a git repository and argo you don't need cloud but let me tell you about one challenge having a kubernetes cluster with capacity to run both argo cd and your application requires a very powerful system basically do try this if your local machine has minimum 16 gb of ram and eight cpus your laptop may not support that yeah that's right even though theoretically it is possible to run it in mini cube but the overall this system is going to consume so many resources that your system will not be able to accommodate them there is only one way by the way swapnil don't use windows machine install linux inside linux install mini cube and make sure that mini cube is given access to almost all the resources of your host machine right and then deploy all these things on there or else even better use cloud why because cloud allows you to create proper kubernetes cluster with dedicated amount of cpu ram number of host and everything okay so you can see sync is okay everything is ready now if i need to make any changes to my application i just have to go and make changes to my git repository and the changes will be immediately reflected in the application running on here and now my app service this is my app service this is the host name of app service and guess what can i access this app service from public endpoint like this it's trying to reach my kubernetes cluster and my application deployed inside kubernetes cluster now i'm not sure whether my application is using port number 880443 or some other port number here i am assuming it's using port 80 okay.
as per this it is currently in a proper thing and it should be up and running app one should be up and running this is my sample app basically i don't know why it's taking a bit longer load balancer is ensured three minutes back but i don't know why but it's taking just longer maybe there is some issue with my application or there is an issue with uh, azure basically because azure creates a load balancer and for that load balancer you need to make sure that it is publicly accessible you need to allow the port access right so that maybe i have to do that on the azure portal itself and then the issue will issue will get fixed or maybe i am using a wrong port number let me check the port number mapping this app one load balancer is currently using uh, target port uh, port number 80 and target port 8080 yeah this should be available now i'm using ip 217 here is 217 and there is a load balancing rule available it's a public ip maybe i'm not sure why what went wrong but anyways the application is up and ready how do i take this application down by the way i can take the application down by simply using delete button and if i have deployed a new version of application i can roll back to the old version from here is that clear you can even check the overall view in this tabular view like this is the cpu and memory usage of your current application and how many pods are currently running there are two pods which are currently degraded that's fine i guess that's the reason why uh, it's actually not working fine this is how it's working like this is the ip address which is supposed to get request from public users and the request goes to the service from service it goes to the pod right but for database database is not accepting any request from outside did you notice that hello and look at this this is not working because my pod is degraded or it's not running did you notice that okay so that's it about gitops you have any issues any 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 concern any queries about gitops now we discuss three things devops github and gitops gitops and github are totally different concept altogether github is a provider gitops is a trend and inside gitops the tool that we use was argo cd more or less other tools also provide similar behavior or similar features okay uh so rt do you have any announcements here before we wind it up okay she has shared a uh, feedback form link sometime back i guess at 1 uh, 1 130 pm so please refer to that and uh, provide your valuable feedback for the session if you have any questions or queries please uh, feel free to put your questions here on a on a chat window yeah thank you very much i'll i'll, I'll remain here logged in till 2:10 So if you have any questions please post them now
the traditional option was the traditional option was what we do is uh, we used to add steps in GitHub Action itself. Okay, in GitHub Action workflow, you can add steps which will first install kubectl, then it will download the Kubernetes credentials file, and then manually use kubectl apply on a particular folder. But kubectl apply space hyphen f provide the folder name, and it will go and read the manifest and deploy them. That was the approach that we used earlier. And we used to add these steps directly in GitHub Action Workflow. Okay, that's how it is done. Yes, we do conduct session for CKAD as well. Swapnil, it is possible to keep them in a different repository as well, but then you will have to make sure that Argo CD has access to that repository, that particular GitHub repository. Keeping it in a same repository will make sure that Argo CD has access to all the configuration files uh, readily. Oh, sorry, in the same Kubernetes cluster means it can access it readily. For Git repository, yes. If it is a public repository, you don't have to worry about it. But if it is a private repository, you have to provide the repository credentials, okay? The Git repository credentials to Argo CD. You can go to the settings button. Wait a second. Okay, so you can go to settings and you can configure your connected repositories from here. Uh, by the way, in production environment, the authentication is done using some kind of uh, yes, Swapnil. If you 